the stigma to the stigma uh, of the other flower where it will create a pollen tube and reach the ovary uh, to create a seed. And like I said, bees are what we study and bees are a, a main pollinator and they get a lot of the attention. Um, but there are other pollinators out there, um, whether it be wasps or flies or beetles or butterflies. Um, and they all have their benefits. As you can see, they're all different uh, sizes and shapes, um, and that really benefits the flowers they come in contact with. So pollinators are not all one fits all. Um, and because of that, native plants have really co-evolved with bees and other pollinators. Um, and these are just some examples of what we call pollination syndromes. Um, I'm only gonna go through so, a few of them, just like some of the fun ones. So if we think of flowers that have evolved to attract hummingbirds, typically uh, those flowers are going to be red in color and they're going to be uh, tubular where they, the hummingbird can reach in far into the flower and grab that nectar in the back. Um, some other fun ones, if you have any night opening flowers, usually they're white and they're fragrant and those are attracting moths as their pollinators. Um, and some, some flowers like to trick their pollinators. So there's some flowers that mimic um, female wasps and usually these are the orchids. Uh, they mimic female wasps and so that invites the male wasp to come and copulate with the flower, but instead it grabs some pollen and ends up pollinating the orchid. Um, another fun mimic uh, that tricks their pollinators are uh, flowers that really smell like rotting animals. Um, if you've ever been to the Missouri Botanical Garden, you know that corpse flower that's blooming, that's that putting out that rotten smell to attract fly pollinators. Um, and it seems to work because there's a lot of different flowers out there and a lot of different pollination syndromes. Um, but back to bees, bees are really an important pollinator um, because they're the only insect group that actively collects pollen to um, provision their nests because pollen is their main nutrition. Um, so bees and flowers have uh, a nice mutualism where the flowers get pollinated um, and fertilized and then the, the bees get nutrition that they need. So the female bee here, this Melisodes bimaculatus, um, and I do mean female because females are the ones that are collecting pollen for their nests. She has a full load of pollen on her leg, this bright yellow spot. Um, and so she's going to collect that and she's going to go back to her nest and we'll talk more about nests, but bee nests can either be in the ground like this, this turret right here or in a cavity. And so that pollen will be made into a ball and an egg will be placed on that pollen ball and sealed and that egg will develop from a larva to a pupa and next year it'll emerge as an adult. Um, that's kind of the cycle of life for the, the bee pollinators and that wouldn't be possible without the pollen. Um, and because bees need pollen, um, they've created, they've developed a few different mechanisms to carry pollen from the flowers to their nests. Um, and so we have up here in the top left corner is Nagapostamon sweat bee. Um, and so you can see this one has scopal hairs. So basically uh, long hairs on their back legs that can cling to pollen. And another type of bees are the megachylids. And these are the leaf cutter bees. And they, instead of having the scopa leg hairs on their leg, they actually have the scopa on their abdomen here. So you can see kind of the outline of the, the yellow pollen on the back side of, of their abdomen. Um, another form of pollen carrying is the corbiculate bees, is a corbiculate basket. So on the back leg, we call it a pollen basket. 
um, this bumblebee will pack all the pollen into a sticky mass there. Um, the masked bees are um, a type of bee in the middle here. It's a really cool pollen transport system. They don't have any hairs. So instead, this hyleus will eat all the pollen at the flower and then carry it in their gut and regurgitate it once they get to the nest. And then finally, there's a whole class of bees that we call cuckoo bees that are parasitic. So they don't collect any pollen themselves. They instead mooch off of all the other bees, really hard work and lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. Um, and so these are just general systems and Nina is going to go through now um, some more specific uh, examples of pollinators and plants. Okay, doing a little transfer here. Hello, everyone. So Jenny has done a really good job talking about the um, the mutualisms between bees and plants and that plants and bees have evolved for a long time together um, and bees have become very good at collecting pollen overall. But some bees take it a step further in that they're what we call specialists. They're essentially very picky eaters in that they get all their food resources from one or just a few different types of plants. So these bees are incredibly efficient and really rely on certain plants in order to survive. So I'm just gonna go over a few specialist bees that you may see in your garden. So the first one is Tylotrix bombiformis. Um, I'm curious to see how the live transcripts do with that word Tylotrix. It's the hibiscus bee. This is the bee that Jenny studies and knows a ton about. So these bees, uh, only visit hibiscus plants, and but they're incredibly efficient at finding hibiscus in the landscape. For example, I have hibiscus in my yard, and last year, within about 45 minutes of the first flower opening, there was already a hibiscus bee on the flower. Another bee is Papanopis pruinosa, or the squash bee. Um, these Bees are actually very easy to find because what happens is the flower opens up early in the day and the females will visit the plant and collect pollen from the flower and then the flower closes later in the day. Most male bees, once they're born, they don't return to the nest, so they have to find somewhere else to hang out when they're not chasing mates. So if you peel back a squash flower late in the afternoon, you can sometimes see multiple squash or one or even seen up to you know eight squash bees, the males all congregating in the flower. And that's where they'll hang out all day. And uh, Pepinopis prunosa is really interesting because squash as a, as a plant that we eat, so you know pumpkins and gourds were domesticated in uh, South and Central America and Mexico. And studies have found that um, as the domestication of squash and the seeds was passed around through different native groups, the bees followed along. So when you trace the genetics of these Pepinopa pruinosa bees, they follow the uh, path of uh, squash domestication around the Americas. Another bee that you might find is Anthermergus passiflore, and this bee visits Passiflora lutea. So you may be familiar with Passiflora incarnata, also called maypops. It's a you know, common, somewhat weedy and aggressive vine native to Missouri, but there's another Passiflora species native here, which is Passiflora lutea. It's much smaller overall and has these small white flowers. And one of the bees that visits it and really relies on it is the Anthermergus. And this bee uh, is interesting in that it collects pollen really, really high up on its leg. It also reuses nests year after year, which is really unique and uncommon for native bees. So these are a few examples of uh, bees that really rely on specific plant species, but there's also plants that um, rely on certain bees. And that's because creating pollen is really energetically costly. Pollen is really high in nutrients um, and just has a lot of protein in it. 
So uh, plants want to make sure, or certain plants want to make sure that they're not wasting that pollen, so that the pollen is only going to be collected by individuals that are then likely to visit another flower and have pollination occur. So certain plants, especially those in Solanaceae family, which is the nightshade family, um, the heath family, which is like blueberries, um, and the coffee family have something called, uh, that requires buzz pollination or sonication. And what it means is that the pollen is stored in the anther, which is the male reproductive organ. And the pollen will only be released if the anther is buzzed at a very specific frequency. And how bees do this is they disconnect their wing muscles and then they vibrate the muscles in their thorax, which is here. And the reason they have to disconnect their wings is because when they vibrate those thorax muscles, those are actually their flight muscles. And if they didn't disconnect their wings, they would just fly away from the flower. So they, vi they disconnect their wings and vibrate the muscle and that causes the pollen to be released. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is a tuning fork, which buzzes at a certain frequency and does a good job of replicating what bees are going to do. So as it starts to vibrate, there's no sound here, but you can see it, the pollen starts to stream out of the anthers of this plant. So that's what all this kind of dust stuff looks like. That's just absolutely streaming out of the plant. So you can see it coming out there. And this is what it looks like when a bee does it. So this is a bumblebee. You can see that she's vibrating the anthers and then the pollen is just streaming out here and landing right on her corbiculate load. So it's a really efficient way for these bees to get pollen. It's an efficient way for these plants to get pollinated because the pollen is only gonna be taken by things likely to actually visit another plant. And this is a, a kind of a special kind of group type of mutualism. And something of note is that a lot of our plants, we are, a lot of, I'd say our best vegetables require um, buzz pollination. So things like tomatoes and peppers require buzz pollination. And one bee that cannot do buzz pollination are honeybees, Apis mellifera. Apis mellifera is a non-native species to North America or actually all of the Americas. Um, they're useful in agricultural systems, but they're certain plants they really can't pollinate at all. So you could put thousands of honeybees in a tomato field and you're not gonna get many tomatoes because tomatoes require buzz pollination. So hopefully this kind of uh, turns buzz pollination from like a buzzword into a concept that you can actually visualize and understand what's going on when people are talking about what, talking about pollinators. We found it's a term that people just use without quite knowing the definition. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Jenny and we're going to talk about, she's gonna talk about bees in the city and some ecological theory. All right. So bees like cities. In Missouri, where we're at, there's about 453 species in the state. Um, and about 200 of those bees are found in the city limits of St. Louis alone. Um, and this is a huge diversity, especially for a city. And we can kind of, we can see some favorites of bees that you might encounter in the city. Um, down here we have the sunflower bee. It's a specialist on sunflowers. And going back to those pollen carrying hairs, it's known for these huge bottle brush back legs with the scopa. Um, for collecting all of that sunflower pollen. Um, we have the masked bees, like we noticed that before that carry the pollen in their guts. Um, we have another kind of leaf cutter bee called a megachylid, um, another type of bumblebee, um, another type of sweat bee, and this other one down here called a, um, it's also a leaf cutter bee called, oh, it's a wool cutter bee. Um, so the nice thing about this is you can notice all the different colors and shapes and sizes. Um, like not all bees are black and yellow. I think that's one of the, the first things people notice is like, wow, there's green metallic bees, there's blue metallic bees. Um, and this diversity can be found through the city and it kind of shows us that 
bees can actually thrive in cities and they're, they're not just a vestige of what biodiversity was here before the city grew up around them. Um, and so we want to know when we look up when we think about bee communities, we want to try to figure out what are what controls the the assemblage of bees and what kind of keeps them here. And so we can look at it from two different ways. We can look at it from large scales, which are climate and historic land use factors. And we can look at it from small scales, which are current land use and other species interactions. Um, and so again, there's, there's a lot that goes into this. And so I just totally covered up those graphs. Don't pay attention to those graphs. All we need to know is that we can't control the large scale factors like climate, like we're stuck with St. Louis's humidity, whether you like it or not. Um, but we can focus on changing the small scale factors like current land use and other species like plants and other animals um, to interact with in the city to um, foster greater biodiversity of those bees. Um, so a reason bees like cities is they can find what they need in cities pretty well. They really only need two things. They need food, which uh, for them are flowers. So pollen, like we talked about, they need, need it for their larva. That contains all the protein and the lipids that they're gonna need for development. The nectar is mostly for adults. Um, those are quick carbs, it really um, keeps them going flying to and from the flowers and to the nest. Um, and then for shelter, uh, those are their nesting materials. And so there's cavity nesters, ground nesters, and some that nest in dead wood. Um, and cavities, we can imagine there's a lot of cavities available in cities. And we do see a higher incidence of cavity nesting bees in cities, um, which is interesting because actually most bees are ground nesters. Um, so we can see that kind of effect of the city has on the bee community where they're kind of selecting for these cavity nesting bees. And so that really tells us that ground nesting bees need a little bit more help in the city in order to thrive and survive. Um, and we will go through examples of, of that in a second of the types of uh, nesting you might find. Um, but as a, another point of spatial scale, bees are small. So all those resources I just talked about need to be contained in one small area because large bees may fly up to half a mile a day, um, but most small bees travel less than two city blocks in their entire lifetime. Um, and we can tell like body length, this graph, we look at graphs all the time, but it's a really nice, demonstration of how body size is related to foraging distance. So we can, that's what kind of tells us that small bees travel small distances and large bees travel large distances. And if you think about if you're in a park, that's really all that's available to these small bees is what, what flowers and nesting sources are in that small park. But if we look at other types of urban areas, we see that it's a lot of different urban land types have the potential to support native bees. And so we have home gardens and vacant lots, but also the parks and the community gardens and farms. And some of these require more investment, but other ones can be passive like those vacant lots. They're just there and whatever, you know, like dandelions or chickweeds, things that are um, flowering on their own really do support a lot of pollinators. Um, and so we have to focus on like what urban land use types we can control and home gardens are huge. Um, they're about 25% of the city by area. And so it's a huge potential to increase the available habitat for native bees. Um, and it's something that we can actually control. We don't have to go through city council. We don't have to buy new land. It's, it's already in our backyards and it's already something we can do. So what can we do? Um, most gardens really aren't supporting native pollinators. So if we look at this example house, it's beautiful. I would move in. 
um, except for the front lawn. So if we look at the lawn, it's a really unnaturally bright green, which indicates that it's treated with a lot of pesticides and fertilizers to make it really bright green. Um, there's few flowering plants and few native plants. So I see a lot of boxwoods and Japanese maples, things that look green and they are plant life, but they're kind of sterile to a bee. There's not a lot of flowers going on um, and it's not giving them that pollen or nectar source that they need. And then there's this thick layer of mulch down here too, which is not letting um, any ground nesting bees uh, have a nesting source. But luckily, um, there's things we can do. So native plants bring native bees to the yard. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the different types of species of native plants that work well. There's a lot of great resources out there and there's even great talks in the speaker series that will go through the different types of native plants and what attracts what. Um, but the point here is really to plant a variety. For the most part, the more plants you plant, the more um, opportunities there are for native bees to um, find the pollen or nectar that they, they like and um, find uh, a good food source. Um, but also we need, we can also increase our nesting resources. So um, like I mentioned before, like I mentioned before, a lot more bees are ground nesters than there are cow nesters. So we can always, um, it's really easy to make more ground nesting habitat. You just don't mulch or you don't add more um, native, uh, or you don't mulch and you don't add any more grass seed. So uh, we can see as I move, I'm going to turn the sound off. So there we go. Turn that back on. Um, so this is just an example of some ground nesting bees. Um, we have one down here that is in the process of starting her nest. Um, if we zoom in on that. And we can see this turret right here is still in process. The, the bees trying to go in there, kind of still excavate it out. Um, and you can see the tiny little tufts of grass. This is a really small area. So leaving small patches are, are really all you need for, for ground nesting bees. And it's just kind of fun to watch them work. I mean, they push out so much soil for how small they are. And it's amazing. This nest will be closed by tomorrow. It takes them just 24 hours to make a nest. And there's also, not to neglect the cavity nesting bees, but there's also cavity nesting bees um, that require small pithy stems. So if you have any um, golden rods and other tall grasses, things that make these kind of stems and reeds, they're going to use that to make um, their nests in the cavities. So if you leave those as much as you can, um, those are really great cavity nesting bee habitats. And so just not knowing, we need to know what to plant. We also need to know how to plant it. So we can look to some other ecological theories that can uh, inform us on how we can plant to get the most bang for our buck. So larger patches generally hold more bees um, as opposed to multiple smaller patches. Um, and then also close patches will have more of the same bees due to connectivity. So that tells us that we don't just need one large front yard or backyard garden and then two miles down the road, we have another garden. We need a consistent um, connect, connection between gardens to really foster a good bee community. And so we're gonna take a step back now and Nina's gonna go through the research, some of behind these ideas of, of bee communities on the landscape. Great, thank you. Okay, yeah, so let's talk about some of the research that's been done looking at the bee community as a whole. So we're gonna show you some graphs, um, but we'll explain them so they don't have to be too scary. 
But this first graph is looking at agricultural hedgerows. So these are uh, strips of land adjacent to agricultural fields that are planted with flowers to, uh, or, you know, shrubs. And these strips of land are to support uh, both pollinators and uh, animals that provide pest control, such as, be, uh, such as birds. And these can be kind of analogous to yards and gardens because uh, you can think of the, the agricultural field as maybe being just a lawn um, and then the hedgerows as being gardens. So we're gonna look at these uh, set of left bars here. And this is richness, which takes into account the number of bees and then also the numbers of species. And the dark bars are hedgerows with just native plants. And the light colored bars are hedgerows with just exotic or non-native plants. And what we see here is that in new hedgerows, so in new habitat, there's not a difference between ones with native plants and one with, ones with exotic plants. However, as the hedgerow matures, we see that there's a much greater impact on the native, uh, on the hedgerows with native plants as compared to exotic plants. So this shows that when you go from no habitat to pretty much having anything, so having any plants, there's not much of an impact between the plants being native versus non-native. However, as the habitat matures, native bees really start to pr uh, prefer and go to the native plants. This is another study looking at the plants that bees are visiting in home gardens. So looking at native plants only, we have about 70 bee species that only visited native plants. And then there's about 50, uh, 50 bee species that only visited non-native plants. However, there's about 100, 100 bee species that visited both native and not native plants. So this indicates that your gar you don't need to be a purist. If your garden has a combination of native and non-native plants, you're actually probably attracting a lot of bee species. As long as you're not planting non-native plants that are invasive or have the potential to be invasive, you know, plant those plants that you really like, like snowdrops, put in that vegetable garden with basil and tomatoes. Uh, a lot of bees are gonna be visiting those plants and actually benefit from those flowers. Um, and non-native plants do have some advantages in that they can often be in bloom before or after native plants are. So they can actually extend the season in which there's plants in bloom. So yeah, just plant, I guess our big takeaway is that native plants really can help, but um, non-native plants provide services as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go over one last graph. I know there's a lot going on here. Um, so what we have here are bars that have the individuals. So this is the counts of bees. And then next to them are going to be uh, the counts of species. You're always gonna have more individuals than species because um, when you're surveying the bee community, there's going to be some species that have multiple individuals. And lastly, if you see a star here, um, a star indicates that there's a significant difference between the two bars. And this means that the, there's a difference and it's due to an underlying ecological reason and not just due to randomness and chance. So what we have here are gardens uh, in the dark bars that have native plants. They're not necessarily all native plants, but they have native plants there. Whereas the white bars are gardens without native plants. So looking at all the bees, the entire bee community, there's a higher number of individuals, but not a higher number of species in yards with native plants. So there's higher number, a higher abundance, but not a higher level of diversity. We see the same trend just looking at native bees. There's a higher number of individuals in yards with native plants, but not a higher number of species. So this indicates that the plants with uh, yards with native plants are maybe providing better quality habitat because it allows the species to increase their numbers, but overall it's not attracting additional species um, of the community overall. However, when we look at cavity nesting bees, so these are bees that nest above ground in cavity. We see both a higher number of individuals and higher number of species in yards with native plants. So this could be two things that bees, either these cavity nesting bees are really relying on native plant species in order for them to survive, 
but most likely there's some other things going on in that the yards with native plants are doing a better job at providing nesting resources for these cavity nesting bees. A lot of cavity nesting bees like to nest in, um, you know, old stems and, uh, you know, other just small cavities that are around. And what's likely is that the yards with native plants are also probably a little, you know, a little messier providing those cavity nesting resources that the yards without native plants are, are not providing. And lastly, looking at ground nesting bees, we don't see any difference in, uh, in gardens with or without native plants when it comes to both individuals and species. And this is something that's been found over and over again is that um, ground nesting bees have a slightly harder time in cities simply because we cover up so much of the ground, either through you know, paving, but also just really thick uh, mulch and like absolutely perfect grass. Um, so something you can really do to help bees in cities, and we got a lot of questions about this, so we'll elaborate more um, in the Q&A session, is to you know, leave some bare patches in your in your yard. If you have a section of your yard where nothing seems to like to grow, everything's dying, just leave it bare. Um, and that can really provide a nesting resource for ground nesting bees. Okay, so those three studies I highlight are actually all happened to happen in California. So I wanted to bring it home um, to St. Louis. So I conduct my research in yards enrolled in Brink Conservation Home, which is a so a garden certification program run by St. Louis Audubon Society, which is one of the presenting partners of this series. Um, so I've done research in those yards for the last two years, and this is a little summary of what I've found. So these are all native plant or gardens with native plants, home gardens. So I found 120 species of bees so far. I've found one new state record, so a bee that's never been found in Missouri before, and now we have four specimens of it at three different locations, which is really exciting. Two species where it's only the, I found the second known specimen of it in the state. Uh, two vulnerable bumblebee species, Bombus fraternus and Bombus pennsylvanicus. Six bees that are new to urbanized St. Louis. So they've been found in Missouri before, but they seem to be moving into the city and really you know, making a home in St. Louis in the more dense urban areas that they haven't before. And this is probably because there's high quality habitat within the city. Um, they're able to expand their range because of the native plants people are putting. And lastly, 11 kleptoparasitic species. So Jenny mentioned these either uh, earlier. These are called cuckoo bees. They're bees that lay their eggs in other bees' nests. And um, because of their unique strategy, they really need a large population of the, of the species that they lay their eggs in. So if you have kleptoparasites, it's a good indicator that you have high quality habitat. So finding 11 kleptoparasitic species in, this, in these yards is a good indication that these yards are providing great habitat. So this just so shows like, you know, we're not kind of talking in abstract. We know that these native plant gardens can provide um, great habitat for bees because they are here, right, in St. Louis. Just to show you one more graph, so this is um, my data. So on the x-axis, which is the axis down here, we have native plant diversity. Uh, these numbers might seem kind of high. This is 60 and 80. Um, don't worry if you don't have that many uh, species in your yard. So how I collected this data is if a plant was in bloom uh, over two visits, it got counted twice. So um, it's uh, most of these people have you know something like a third of this actual diversity. And here on the y-axis here, we have bee diversity. So this is the number of species. And on this graph on the right, we have a bee abundance, which is the number of individuals. But what we see is a positive trend with both. As you increase native plant diversity, you increase both the number of bee species, as well as the number of individuals of bees. And one thing that's really important about this native plant diversity and the houses that have higher diversity and abundance, it's because they have floral resources uh, all throughout the summer. So uh, having flowers that are in bloom from you know, April, May, all the way through September and October is gonna make sure that there's food in your yard at all times of the year that bees are out. If you have a month where you have nothing in bloom, it's going to have caused bees to kind of look other way, other places because you're not providing food for them. 
So making sure you have a diversity of what we say phenology of flowering time is really important. Okay, and with that, we're done with some of the, you know, the, the data and graphs. And um, we always like to include as many fun photos as we can. So we just wanted to highlight a few bee species that you may find in your yard and a few flowers you might uh, find them on. This is no means exhaustive from both the bee perspective and the plant perspective, but we just wanted to uh, kind of show you the diversity of bees because we found that a lot of people have a lot of bees in their yard, but they don't necessarily know that they're bees because bees just have an incredible uh, diversity in shape and size and color. So this is one of my favorite. This is Agapostamon varescens or the bicolored sweat bee. It has this really striking green head and thorax and then this black and white striped abdomen. Uh, these bees really like uh, plants in the Asteraceae family uh, and you'll find it on, you know, Coryopsis, obedient plant and then compass plant among other things. This is the Andrina. Um, these are really common spring bees. Um, they're just starting to come out now. And uh, but there's also species that you'll find in the summer, including one that is a specialist on Rutabecchia. Uh, but so these are Andrina. You'll find them, they really like Cersus and other early flowering shrubs and uh, trees. Try to Scantia, which is spiderwort and Salix willow. These are Melisodes. These are one of my favorite. They're called the longhorn bees. And uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the times male bees don't return to the nest after they're born, so they got to find somewhere to be. And you'll often find these Melisodes, males especially, aggregating and sleeping in flowers or on sticks at night. Um, so if you look at dusk, you can often find them aggregating. And yeah, you can tell because they have these crazy long antenna. The antenna on the males are about three quarters the length of the body size. You'll find these on Vernonia, which is ironweed, helianthus, and then there's a specialist one that visits thistle. However, we do have some non-native thistle species in the area. So if you're planting thistle, make sure you have one of the native species because the non-native ones are invasive. And lastly, um, Hylaeus. Uh, this photo doesn't really show the bee up close. And I chose this one in particular because it shows how small the bee is. These bees are about three millimeters in length, which I like to think the last time you clipped your fingernails, one of those little slivers of your, maybe your pinky, uh, your pinky nail is probably, is about the size of these bees. They're absolutely tiny. The females have these really cool triangles on either side of their eyes on their face. And the males are kind of have all yellow on their face. And they're just absolutely tiny. Um, you'll find them a lot on Asclepius, which is milkweed, hydrangea, and then mountain mint. And if you want to learn more about uh, specific bees and specific plants, um, the author Heather Holm has some really great books um, that look into this, including this one on the left that also has things on butterflies, moths, wasps, and flies. Um, this one is in the St. Louis Library System. There's one copy right now at the Buter Branch. But right now with the uh, joint catalog now between the St. Louis County and St. Louis Public Library System, you can reserve it from anywhere. That's my little plug. Um, so yeah, there's one copy at Buter Branch. So may the best person uh, get it first. Uh, but yeah, Heather Holm has some really great books that um, we recommend. And they're also um, very much tailored for the Midwest um, and East Coast, which is great. And with that, that's mostly what we have for you. I'm gonna do some conclusions and a few closing thoughts, and then we would be happy to answer questions. Um, I saw a lot of questions on ground nesting bees, which I think Jenny is excited to answer. Mm -hmm. So the first is that native plants and native pollinators have a long evolutionary history. Um, they've evolved to rely on each other. The plant gets pollination services and the bee gets pollen, which it uses to provision its young. And this makes them excellent pollinators. Uh, pollinators call urban gardens home. So there's a lot of evidence showing that bees are already doing really well in cities and they're benefiting from people intentionally planting native plants in their yards. However, there's still, you know, we can still make cities better for bees. And the big thing we can do is increase habitat connectivity. 
And so that means not only, you know, putting native plants in your yard, but, you know, talking to your neighbors, trying to get them to put a few things in. Um, even if you have a lot of plants and they just have a few, that will help increase the connectivity and make it easier for bees to move around the urban matrix and increase their population numbers. So if you're ever, if you have native plants in your yard and you're thinning them, maybe try to foist them upon your neighbors, um, kind of spread the word about how important native plants are. Um, and this can really help improve urban habitat for bees. The last thing I'm gonna plug is I run a, a, shutter, a citizen science project called Shutter Bee with Nicole Miller-Strutman at Webster University. Uh, we're recruiting participants for this year. Uh, what the project does is get you to take photos of bees in your yard or you know, adjacent area and post them on iNaturalist. Um, there's no experience necessary to participate. All you need is a camera or smartphone. If you're interested in participating or um, know someone who might be, you can fill out just our interest survey, which is at tinyurl.com slash SLCL St. Louis County Library, Shutter Bee. Also, if you Google Shutter Bee, you'll find our website and the sign up link is there. And with that, we wanted to plug some upcoming talks that we think will kind of talk a little bit more about specific plants you can plant um, or more about attracting wildlife to your yard. And that's uh, going to be the Rainscaping with Native Plants talk on March 30th, and then Gardening for Backyard Wildlife on April 6th. And with that, um, I think that's all we have and we'd be really happy to take any questions. So thank you all for listening. Well, thank you so much. Um, appreciate it. And th thank you for the plug as well uh, <laughs> for the, uh, the merger of our catalogs. Um, and I just wanted to comment, um, since you mentioned that Heather Holm has several books, we probably also have access through Mobius, which that service I believe is supposed to restart in April. So we'll be able to get in other books as well. So um, just be patient with us as we get through this, uh, this merger for all these wonderful act, um, materials that you'll have at your fingertips. So thank you, Jenny and Nina for um, a wonderful uh, look at uh, the pollinators in our yards. So as, uh, as Nina mentioned, there were a lot of questions about ground uh, nesting bees. And so I'll, we'll start there. Um, so some folks asked, I think in the photo that was shown, they had some specific questions about that. They, they thought it looked maybe like sandy soils um, and that almost as big as vole holes, or is that the kind of soil that they were working with or the kind of size of the holes that they might've created? Yeah. So in that particular photo, um, it's, it's not sand. It's just really compacted clay soil that they actually uh, kind of bind together and push out of the nest in little packets. There are sand specialists though, so um, sand is definitely uh, a ground nesting bee material. And they're about, they, they only make the nest about as big as they need to get in. So imagine like, like the width of like a pencil, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit bigger. Um, that's about the size that was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so funny. Context is everything, right? For, right. <laughs> for photos. Um, they're definitely, then, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All of the other ground nesting bee questions in one um, quick fire. Perfect. Um, so when that's how thick mulch you need, uh, ground nesting bees don't like mulch. So if you can leave a part of your yard with no mulch, that is no mulch is best. Um, leaves are not great but they're better than mulch um and some other bees like bumblebees like to nest in leaf litter so it, it leaves to help some bees um someone asked about sunniness so or shadiness um they like full sun um i think that's it I think I'll yeah i would add so you know we understand like putting mulch in and stuff to get your plants established to keep down weeds so it's totally fine to you know, have mulch, but as the plants grow bigger and are kind of choking out weeds, maybe start to remove some of that mulch. Um, the big thing is to not put a ton of garden fabric if you can help it because bees, the whole thing is that bees are small. They can't move large pieces of mulch. They can't get through the garden fabric. So just trying to keep some bare soil if you can will really aid uh, ground nesting bees. Perfect. Um, so, 
thank you for for tackling all those questions about the ground nesting uh, bees. And yeah, I think people probably we don't tend to think of of those in particular. So it was helpful information for sure. Especially um, someone asked about um, as we're getting through our spring yard cleaning, preparing for our um, spring plantings and things. When's a good time to um, clear things to for for like for, say the bees to make be able to to do their nesting. There's not a hard and fast answer. I mean, ideally you just leave it and just let it decompose kind of naturally, but we know some people, you know, have HOAs or, you know, a neighbor that's complaining. Um, definitely trying to lay, wait until it's a little bit warmer. So maybe the beginning of June to really start chopping things back. By then a lot more bees will have emerged. Um, you can also, you know, do some deadheading and things like that at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the fall before bees have really started to nest in the plants um can be helpful but you know ideally just let your garden be more natural and just let it be a little messy and let things decay as they decay yeah i mean i am not i'm i'm quite the lazy gardener if i could even call myself that much and so that definitely appeals appeals to me <laughs> yeah. and hopefully a lot of us too um so there it is a, there's an interesting question about those kinds of bees that maybe are seen as nuisances like carpenter bees and other things that um, you know, are boring into house, you know, home structures, shelter structures, or benches where people sit. Where's, how do we find a happy balance with those? <laughs> uh, you want, okay, so there, we have one species of large carpenter bee, ear, bee in the area, Xylocopa virginica. Um, they are doing absolutely fine in cities. There's plenty of wood for them to bore in. If they're boring in your foundation or your deck or something and you don't want them to, I'd say it's totally okay to try to target their removal. Um, the species will be fine. They're doing absolutely fine. The easiest way to detract them from nesting, you know, building structures with something you don't want to, is just to like plug their holes with like steel wool or something like that that they can't get through. Um, that will do a really good job of targeting just this one species and is way more friendly than, you know, spraying pesticides or something like that. Great tip, thank you. Um, so then there were a lot of questions about um, how species are doing. You mentioned that the carpenter bees are that are uh, around here are doing just fine. Um, and the slide you had with the species, there were 120 species you mentioned. Um, and, and of those, only two were mentioned as being vulnerable. Is um, So someone had a question about, you know, we hear the bees are going extinct, is that all bees clearly that seems to be not the case right here at this particular moment, but you know what should people be thinking about in terms of those kinds of stories that we hear about bee extinctions? Or yeah, there's only two vulnerable, I just said two vulnerable bumblebee species, so we have plenty of vulnerable species. Um, I'll pass it on to Jenny to kind of just talk about bee trends and declines overall. Yeah, um, so when we hear about bees in the news, a lot of news outlets are talking about honeybees. Um, so honeybee collapse disorder is a thing, but that's not something that we necessarily are concerned about because um, honeybees are kind of a managed species. So it's saying that like bird populations are going down if um, chicken populations are going down. Um, it's just one managed species out of the whole thing. Um, when we look at bees in cities, what we do notice is that ground nesting bees are declining and specialist bees um, are declining uh, in as a percentage of the total population. Um, so what we can do is kind of the things that we said, like they really just need habitat. Habitat loss is the main driver of um, species declines. So um, as much as we can, providing nesting and food resources really um, helps keep them around. Yeah, and I, th I think that was um, another that dovetails nicely to another question that um, that we tend to get in programs. Uh, I didn't see a lot of those questions here, but um, we tend to get them. You know, how do we attract or encourage you know, movement? Someone said, if if bees are only traveling a half mile, how do if we wanted to, them to migrate uh, beyond and and move to other neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Um, I'm I think you were right after this question was posed, I think you kind of answered it, but just to be clear, 
native planting, right, is a good way to encourage movement. Yeah. Sure. And also limiting, we didn't really mention it, but limiting pesticides. So when you get your yard fogged for mosquitoes, when you get your lawn treated, uh, they say all those things only impact mosquitoes and are only killing lawn weeds, but that's definitely not true. Those things are, you know, kind of decimating everything in their wake. So, um, you know, trying to limit those, trying to see what the ordinances are in your city and seeing if you can get them changed to limit some of that broad, like broad, uh, broad spraying. Those mosquito sprays really don't even work that well. Um, so kind of trying to think about the, you know, the overall habitat as well and trying to make it better. And that's not just, that won't just help bees, but, you know, those sprays are killing off caterpillars, which birds eat. Um, I know Doug Ptolemy talked a lot about oaks and caterpillars. So um, overall, those like broad scale pesticides are definitely a problem in agricultural systems, but are also impacting us here um, with people's, you know, ta super tailored manicure styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points. Um, so if we're encouraging them to, we want them to come in and, and live in our yards. Um, there was the discussion, someone raised a question about where to get a beehive, and you said we suggest um, bee houses, and um, there are a lot of questions about bee holes, you know, if you're, what kind of wood should you use, that sort of thing. Do you want to address that a bit? Sure. So bee hotels, you can, I think someone asked about cedar, I think cedar is fine. Um, bee hotels, the holes should be between an eighth of an inch and what half an inch diameter is the size. Mm -hmm. um, make sure they're at least like four or five inches long. A lot of the commercial ones you'll see are about three inches long. And that has implications for bees because a lot of the bees that use cavity nests, they lay all their females first and then they lay males at the end. And if the hole, if the if the cavity is too short, then they just lay females and don't lay any males. So um, those can have implications, just something yeah. kind of cool. <laughs> that might uh, be a problem. <laughs> yeah, because bees can decide which sex their offspring are, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only other thing um, about bee hotels is if you have a choice between a smaller one and a larger one, actually go for the smaller one. So it's the only kind of detraction against we see against bee hotels is because in nature, they're going to be going like a few cavities here, a few cavities there. So when some of those cuckoo bees see a giant bee hotel, that's just like a giant buffet for, for a parasitic bee. So mm -hmm. having a few smaller blocks is better than just having one, one large block. Because there's a lot of wasps and things like that that will take over bee hotels as well. And then also just mites and other kind of diseases. If you have too large of a hotel, they'll just spread through it and um, just kind of decimate the whole population. So definitely having a few smaller is better than one large. Great. I'm going to ask what's the best place to place them, just in a sunny spot. And off the ground so that they don't get attacked by ants. Yes, <laughs> that's the thing. there's always so many moving moving parts, but that's why we have you guys here to <laughs> uh, re remind us of all these details that we should think about. Um, and in fact, yeah, does it matter what direction it's positioned and someone just asked? Yeah, the data is a little mixed on that. I think it's not super important. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Um, it's good to know what details we don't have to worry about as well. Um, and so I think those are handling most of the the general kinds of questions that we that we had. You had some. Um, I think you'd address a lot of the questions in the chat as we were going on early on, um, but I might have missed anything. So if there's. Oh, there's here's a good one because I know we've talked about this in some of the other programs we've had dealing with um, bird houses. Is do you have to worry about the cleanliness of a bee hotel if if it seems you know is there times where you would have to worry about cleaning those or replacing them? You should definitely replace or replace them or clean them every few seasons, like pesticides or um, things like mites, liberal mites, like could build up in there. So. Um, yeah, I, not every season, but just every once in a while or start to replace them when they seem like they have cracks or holes in them. Um, yeah. Great. 
Um, yeah, I see. Thanks, Jenny, uh, or sorry, Nina, for for putting in the, the URL for the Shutterbee. Um, I just want to remind everyone that I will be sending, um, well, our, our department assistant will send out the link uh, for the recording as well as um, a PDF with links to resources mentioned today. So um, if you missed anything, don't worry. Uh, we'll make sure you get um, access to that information. That's what we're here for. Um, yeah, so if there are any last questions, there is one about frogs that I that might be diverging from our main topic, but they ask, do frogs like certain bees? Do any of our native frogs? So bees are predated upon, but not with any like consistency. They're, I guess, I don't yeah, think. Crane mantises or birds that can eat them, wasps, but spiders, you'll see like jumping spiders eating bees, but I don't think. Um, there's not many, I mean, there's not going to be tons of flowers near where frogs are necessarily hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and bees are, you know, the term busy bee, I would say, is correctly idiomatic in that female bees are very busy. Uh, well, they're very lazy in the morning. A lot of them sleep in until about 10 a.m. But while they're out, they're very active, collecting, collecting pollen on the flowers, constructing nests. They're really um, very efficient and um, can be a little hard to catch because of that. Yeah, good good point. Yeah, there's probably more prey of convenience than like sought after. <laughs> Just having wrong place, wrong time. Um, yeah, so I think we'll go ahead and and end it there and just keep an eye out for um, for those links, everyone. Thank you again, uh, Nina and Jenny, so so much for sharing your um, your research with us and your your expertise on the subject. You know, uh, clearly we had a, a pretty big audience today. So this is an important topic and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, well, thanks everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and please join us for another uh, webinar for the Payton Partners in Native Lands, for Native Landscaping in the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, take care. Thanks again. Bye. Bye, thanks.